In the world of Diablo, angels and demons fight for control in the eternal conflict. Let's just say the world isn't full of sunshine and rainbows. So stay a while and listen. I'm Jason with Curse, here to bring you the top 5 forgotten Diablo characters. To start off, here's an easy one, Mendel, or perhaps better known as Kalan. Mendel was the younger brother of the famed Odyssean, and he saw both of his parents and several of his siblings fall to a virulent plague that ravaged the countryside. As a result, he was left with his older brother to tend to the farm near Serum. While spending time on the farm had hardened his body, his real passion was more scholarly. He was often reading scrolls, obtained from the merchant Cyrus, and read because he wanted to learn, something that his brother never understood. One day his friend Achilleos brought him a strange, stone-like object that he'd encountered in the wilderness. Upon touching the stone, Mendel experienced a strange sensation of agelessness, a concept that baffled him. The contact with the stone had changed him. He was beginning to have visions, reliving final moments of a murdered cleric. He would occasionally black out, having no memory of the events that had transpired. His power would later manifest further during their travels to include seeing the spirits of the dead and to unconsciously learn the ancient magic of the spirit realm. In time, he would meet Tragul and Rathma, and Rathma would begin to train Mendel as his successor. Mendel would also continue to aid his brother Eldician and the Adiram in their quest, saving many lives in the process. After the Injiris Council's final decision to spare Sanctuary but wipe the memories of the conflict, Mendel found he was the singular exception. Not only did he keep his memories, but also his powers. He then changed his name to Kalan and joined Rathma and Tragul as a guardian of the balance. In the years that followed, Kalan would form the priests of Rathma, or necromancers, and they still exist to this day, striving to restore balance wherever it is lost. While you may have heard his name, Rackus, the King of Westmarch, his life took place long before the darkening of Tristram. Rackus was a devout champion of the Zakarum faith and lived during the 11th century. He was close friends with the Emperor Tassara of Kedjistan and throughout the course of his military career was famed and respected for his defense of the empire from both internal and external threats. At one point, Emperor Tassara converted to the Zakarum faith in an attempt to settle the growing civil unrest. A handful of nobles had pooled their fortunes in order to raise an army to overthrow the Emperor, and Rackus was called upon to crush the rebellion. Rackus was widely successful in this endeavor despite being outnumbered. He was often found outmaneuvering the opposing army and never lost a single battle. He claimed total victory in just under three years. Rackus' victories made him a legend, and the people saw his success as proof of their faith's legitimacy and strength. At some point, Rackus discovered a tome that depicted tales of the Nephilim and of their ruined civilization in the West. To Rackus, they sounded as if they were gods, and he wondered if the tome would lead him to their power. The Emperor was wary of Rackus' growing power and popularity. He ordered him to sail west to enlighten the new world with faith of Zakarum. Rackus was all too happy to oblige, as the tome had mentioned the fallen city of Corvus, and he desperately wanted to find it. His path was hard fought. The local tribes of barbarians were not keen on an outside ruler, but clever Rackus never wavered. In time, he would bind himself through marriage to one tribe and unite the rest. In celebration, he would found the city of Westmarch. He never gave up on finding the city of Corvus, and his efforts were eventually rewarded. Deep in the blood marsh, worn blocks of stone were found, suggesting this was the location he sought. He found the entrance into the catacombs and was often found to walk their endless halls. However, a decade would pass, and while Westmarch would experience rapid growth and success, Rackus was unable to obtain the power of the Nephilim that he sought. It was said that at the age of 100, Rackus died peacefully in his sleep with his only request to be buried among the ruins of Corvus. Our next character was featured in only a single book, The Black Road, the mighty demon Cabraxis. Now, Cabraxis has dwelt within the mortal realm for as long as recorded history, being first summoned into sanctuary by the Vazari clan long before the Sin War. He had often been killed and banished as well, typically with the aid of an enchanted sword named Storm Fury, specifically forged to slay the demon. Around the time of the darkening of Tristram, Cabraxis had already been banished, 
and had been waiting for his demonic portal to be activated since it was buried under a long lost city. His wishes were finally answered, and the portal was opened by a fallen Zakarum priest, who sought his power, offering to act as Cabraxus's conduit to the mortal realm. Cabraxus agreed, and began to establish a new religion in an effort to combat the forces of Zakarum. Unfortunately, he was slain by a hero who would be found to wield the Storm Fury, but in doing so, the hero would become the demonic host Cabraxus required. Storm Fury was found to keep Cabraxus's influence to a mere whisper, but the hero found that he could successfully wield the mighty demonic powers. He decided to be a force for good and became a healer. While that may have been the last we heard from Cabraxus, there is a bit more to tell. It is said that he is an enemy of the three brothers, Diablo, Mephisto, and Baal. Despite their superior power, they fear him. This is largely due to Cabraxus being extremely intelligent, but also patient and content to wait for his plans to come together, even if they take centuries to complete. Typically, he has focused on establishing false religions with the intention of enslaving mankind. Apparently, even after being outed as a demon, some of his tenets have been integrated into other religions and teachings due to the wisdom they impart. The Sin Wars marked an important period in Sanctuary's history. Malik, the High Priest of the Order of Mephis, was a trusted lieutenant of the Primus and was influential in the outcome. Malik joined the Triune as a simple acolyte, but worked his way up by means of dedication, perseverance, and the occasional murder of a rival. Before long, Lucian the Primus, or head of the Triune, had taken note and even dubbed Malak as his favorite. The Triune had led their followers to believe that the three brothers had created Sanctuary, but were betrayed by Anarius and thus cast out from the realm they created. Malak was interested in power above all and understood that by serving the Triune, he would eventually be rewarded with powers unfathomable, even to the great mage clans. As a taste of that power, Malik was granted an increased lifespan by Lucian and sent away to hunt down Odysseus. His initial attempt was thwarted by Lilith in disguise, allowing Odysseus to easily defeat Malik and his summoned demons. In failure, Malik returned, but Lucian gave him a second chance. His arm was augmented with a demonic limb and was given a band of Morlu to assist in the attack. But again, he was easily defeated, even with the element of surprise on his side. This time, however, Lilith turned his arm against him and flayed him alive, resulting in a quick death. But in Sanctuary, death is rarely the end. Malik's spirit was summoned from beyond by Mendelm, who bound his spirit inside one of his bones. Malik's spirit was to serve as a guide for Odysseus during his attack on the Triune. Somehow, Malak had convinced Odysseus to cast aside his bone in the darkness, and while Odysseus charged ahead to confront Lilith, the bone had in fact impaled a poor priest in the forehead, allowing Malak to possess the body. Malak sought nothing more than revenge on the one he deemed ultimately responsible for his fate, Odysseus. But due to the unholy merger of spirit and host body, the body was deteriorating quickly. To keep pace, Malik would often be found swapping bodies simply to prolong his life. Each time the possession was easier, but the bodies decayed faster and faster. In desperation, he would make a pact with Diablo and Inarius. Inarius allowed Malik to possess his trusted servant, Oris. In this disguise, Malik would lead the final charge of the Cathedral of Light against the Adiran forces led by Odysseus. During this battle, Malik would possess a captain in Odysseus' army and attempted to take control of Mendelm. But an unexpected intervention from Achilleos would prevent Malik's evil plot, and Mendel made quick work of the spirit, banishing Malik forever to the afterlife. Finally, we have Bartok, the warlord of blood. He lived around minus 300 Anno Kajistani and was a powerful member of the Vizari clan. His brother, Horizon, was equally powerful, and they were both ambitious and interested in the power one could obtain from the practice of demonic magic. Horizon believed in bending demons to his will, but Bartok became sympathetic to the plight of the demons. Even believing that to best understand the demons, it was better to ally with the Burning Hells. When the Mage Clan Wars began, Bartok fought for the Vizari, earning him the title of Warlord of Blood for his ritual of bathing in the blood of his enemies. This ritual infused Bartuk with incredible powers. In addition, his armor was said to have demonic sentience. Empowered, he was unstoppable and instilled great fear in both enemies and his allies. 
Bartok now believed that demons were humanity's masters and that service to them would be rewarded. Horizon, however, began to realize his brother's madness and warned the ruling council to strip away Bartok's rank. The Vizari council did so, but the ensuing conflict split the Vizari clan apart into a civil war. Bartek would lead his demonic forces against his own people, and in what would be the final battle of the war, Horizon would meet Bartuk on the field. The ensuing battle was cataclysmic, leading to the deaths of hundreds of thousands. In the end, both brothers realized that they had been pawns for the leaders of the Burning Hells. But while Bartuk attempted to cast a counterspell, Horizon seized the moment to decapitate his brother. Bartuk's body was unable to be completely destroyed, even by the most powerful mages, due to the demonic armor that he had worn. Horizon feared his brother's fast power, even in death, and so ordered that his body be dismembered and hidden in two caves. A millennia later, the tales of Bartuk would again be heard in Sanctuary. His armor had found its way to a host, both helmet and armor possessing two individuals, who nearly became Bartuk incarnate. A clever priest of Rathma would prevent that tragedy from occurring, and with the help of Horizon negated the armor's power, thus freeing Sanctuary from Bartuk's bloody legacy. Hey, if you're interested in content like this, keep an eye out here for more, and be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Check out DiabloFans.com for other Diablo-related information. I'm Jason with Curse saying thanks for watching, and enjoy the game.